Hello. Today I'm going to be talking about fall blooming plants and fall planted spring blooming flowers. There are some plants that save all of their big debut show until the fall season. They sit there all year. Maybe they're pretty plants, but there's not many blooms, if any at all. And then in late summer and fall, they burst forth with gorgeous blooms. We're going to talk about a number of those that do really well in many parts of the state of Texas. And we're also going to talk about some of those things that you plant in the fall for the spring bloom show. We have things like biennials, for example. They complete their life cycle in more than one year. Uh, there's a number of different things we can seed out in the fall that look absolutely awesome in the spring. And if you wait till spring, you're a little too late for the best results. Well, I'm going to get out of the way now and let's go straight to the slides. In putting this talk together, I thought about all the different fall blooming plants and fall planted flowers that bloom in spring that I could include. And it was difficult limiting it to just a few. But I think these are some of the ones that you may be very familiar with, as well as others you may not, that do very well in many parts of the state. And I'll try to make comments on that as we go along. Uh, and also I threw a few in that you may not be that familiar with. So let's get going. Oxblood lily, Rhodophiala bifida, is one of my favorite fall blooming plants because it's the one that heralds the end of summer best, I think. Uh, oxblood lily has been hiding underground all year and as summer has turned uh, landscapes and pastures or wherever it happens to be growing into just a parched fried and dried remain the oxblood lily with the first flush of cooler fall rain pops out of the ground and really puts on a show look at this old homestead where the house is long gone not much at all left but because of where the oxblood lilies are, you kind of can see where maybe an old flower bed was or, or a building or something that uh, was they were planted around. That's kind of a cool scene and it kind of reminds us of the feature that these plants have that helps them live in Texas. I like to call them winter Texans and the reason is like the winter Texans that come down from up north and go down to the valley. Uh, in the Winnebago or whatever, uh, they get out of Texas in the summer by going underground and having no above ground growth to speak of. Uh, then when fall comes, they pop out of the ground, do their bloom show for a little while, and then the leaves appear. And the leaves go all through the winter when it's easy to live in most parts of Texas and uh, replenish the bulbs underground. And then as the weather warms up, they go back uh, disappear again underground, kind of like a winter Texan packing everything up when summer's on the way and heading back up north again. Uh, oxblood lilies are great survivors. I think that the little blooms look sort of like strappy amaryllis flowers and they're, they're really, I think, attractive. Although they don't last a long time, they're well worth having because they'll pop up and surprise you and then disappear again. Spider lily, Lycoris radiata, is another one of those harbingers of the fall season. Uh, I like to think of spider lilies as a little fireworks display, going up into the air and exploding in all directions, uh, announcing and celebrating the fact that summer is over, or at least it soon will be. And uh, I think hurricane lily is another name for them because uh, they occur during the fall time when uh, we typically get a lot of hurricanes through the Gulf Coast uh, area. Uh, and the um, oxblood lily that I previously showed is also sometimes called schoolhouse lily for the same reason. About the time kids go back to school is when we start to get the kind of weather that allows these blooms to show up and go. Uh, look at the blooms up close. The narrow recurved petals, just long uh, filaments and anthers coming out of the flower. Really attractive. A great cut flower too, by the way. Mexican mint marigold is a dual purpose plant. Uh, it does well in the herb garden. Here you can see it framed by some bay trees and uh, it all through the season it has a mound of green foliage. Uh, the foliage smells like black jelly beans, kind of that licorice smell and I think it's really pleasant. Uh, we can't grow French tarragon here uh, but we can use something really close as a spice in the kitchen and that's Mexican mint marigold. Uh, it truly is a marigold. The uh, scientific name or proper name uh, to Jetty's lucida 
Uh, the uh, Tejetis is the same as your common garden marigolds that you plant, uh, but this one is a perennial. And again, in fall, out pops these upright shoots with flowers on the end uh, that are really beautiful. They look like little single marigold flowers when you look at them up close. Copper Canyon Daisy. Uh, Copper Canyon Daisy, another plant through the year, sprawling all over the place. And then in fall, here comes all the blooms that just cover over it. Now this plant, uh, it has a strong citrus pine scent. I happen to like it and some people do. Some people find it uh, just too pungent uh, and they don't care for it. But if you brush by it, the air will be filled by that scent. It's got finely cut little marigold leaves because it is also a Tejetis. This one is Tejetis lemonii. Uh, and uh, I think that if, there were, if, if this were a variety, we should call it Flopsy because that's kind of how it grows. They need to develop one that is compact. I guess they could call that tidy. Uh, that would sure give this plant a wider use in landscapes. Uh, but as you can see here, and especially if you like kind of a cottage type landscape where things are sprawling all over and popping up all over anyway, uh, this would be a great plant for that. Uh, but it's well worth growing. Uh, and if you're in an area where deer just mow everything down to the ground, you might give it a try. I've never seen deer eating it. Not, I've learned to not call any plant deer proof. Uh, because if deer get hungry enough, they'll open your front door, jump over you in the recliner, and go to the kitchen and start rummaging through the crisper. Uh, so uh, I would say this is as close to deer proof as you can get. It probably is, but uh, I think if deer get hungry, they'll eat, eat just about anything. Philippine violet, another wonderful plant. All through the year, dark green leaves and beautiful little plants. Then when fall comes, Oh my gosh, it loads up with these uh, purplish, uh, lavender purplish flowers, uh, even toward the bluish range a little bit. Uh, there is a white form also available. Very, very pretty. Look at the blooms. Uh, here's some close up of the blooms and why it blooms for such a long season. You can see here as you look at it uh, that in the area where the terminals are and where leaf buds or, or where leaf uh, uh, nodes appear on the stem, you get all of these buds. And so it's got blooms every day, but it's also producing blooms for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And it stays in bloom for a long season. Mexican bush sage, I think, should be the poster plant of fall blooming plants in Texas. Uh, Salvia leucantha, uh, this particular plant, I think is beautiful during the season. It forms a mound of silvery green foliage that is very narrow, uh, kind of a lance shaped, and uh, has a, a dark purple flower or a purple and white flower. Uh, the difference between the two forms, uh, the purple and white flower, the calyx is purple right here at the base, and the flower itself is white. In the all purple form, the flower is purple also. Now, there are a number of other varieties that are very hard to find, but uh, they are available out there. One of them is called Pink Velour. In Pink Velour, the calyx is white and the flower is pink. And in White Velour, it's all white. Very unusual looking for this plant. I have not tried those, uh, off color, I'll call them off-color varieties uh, here. Uh, Daniel's Dream, by the way, is another one that has the soft pink flowers with a white calyx. And although I haven't tried them here, I think it'd be worth a try. I don't know that they'll be as strong as the original, uh, but they're worth a try. If this plant gets a little large, and it can, uh, look for a variety called Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is about three feet tall, so it's kind of compact compared to the original, uh, and uh, it's well worth planting. And another technique would be to shear it a couple of times, stop before mid-season, uh, mid-summer, uh, to help form some branching and create a, uh, more terminals and a compact plant because salvias, like a lot of plants, bloom on the terminals. You get a shoot and you get a bloom on the end of that shoot. And so if you, if you shear back that shoot, like looking here at the base of the picture where the leaves come out, there's two buds gonna, that are ready to form branches. So if you, if you cut it off above that, you get two shoots, which means you get two flower spikes. 
So uh, if a plant is a little bit uh, scraggly, which sometimes they can be, not as beautiful as the one I showed you in the picture, uh, then just shear them back a little bit. But, but stop that by about midsummer because you want to give it time to grow and set blooms for the fall show. Another good choice, mountain sage. Mountain sage is native to the Chisos Mountains in West Texas. If you've ever been to Big Bend, that's the Chisos Mountains. And uh, it also goes into a large area of Mexico. Uh, it is a great plant because it produces these flowers in the fall season. Uh, and the flowers are very large tubular salvia type flowers. Uh, very look it looks very much like a typical salvia flower of many of the species of salvia. Uh, salvia regla uh, is, is really a, a royal, beautiful uh, uh, plant for the garden. And another thing about it that we like is salvia regla is favored by hummingbirds. And, you know, if you're a hummingbird making the long path of migration, it sure is nice to stop off in the Chisos Mountains and have something to energize you for the road ahead, if you will. Uh, I think it's excellent. Again, a very upright plant in this case that if it is a little spindly, don't be afraid to shear it. All of the salvias almost uh, do well if they get sheared a little bit to create more of a compact bushy plant uh, that looks good. So you make your decision on that. I think you'll, I think you'll appreciate the results of some shearing. Fall aster used to be called Aster oblongifolium. Now it's Symphiotrichum oblongifolium. Uh, it, during the year, it's kind of a, oh, I don't know, not so noticeable plant. It's a little shrub. It can be a little scraggly growing around. Shearing again makes it more compact. This is uh, a picture of some plants uh, that were um, just about to start blooming. You see a few of the lavender blooms starting to appear. Uh, as, as fall arrives, here comes the blooms and they cover the plant up. Very beautiful, uh, nice uh, uh, color. I love the, that violet purple color that they, that they put out, a little bit lavender perhaps. Uh, and the other thing I like about this plant uh, is it is attractive to beneficials like hoverflies. You can see if you look in the middle of the picture that hoverfly visiting this plant. These, these flowers were growing in Fredericksburg, Texas, and, and I, the day I was there, it, it, was just, it was just buzzing with hoverflies everywhere. Uh, hoverflies have larvae that eat, that eat aphids and some other uh, pests, and so it's definitely one that we would want to plant, and there are other beneficials that are attracted to fall aster as well. Confederate rose, hibiscus mutabilis. Uh, the reason we call it mutabilis is that the blooms change. Uh, you might remember the rose mutabilis, where the, the rose blooms come out kind of a buttery yellow, and then they go into a pinkish stage and kind of finish up a reddish burgundy. Uh, that is also true of this plant. Uh, that's a brand new bloom coming out white, and then uh, and rather than the buttery yellow like the true rose does, uh, and then it goes through pink and on into burgundy, even toward the end of the day. But you can see as you look at these plants up here at the top, there's buds for tomorrow and the next day and the next day waiting in the wings to come on. Now this plant gets kind of large. Uh, it'll get, uh, in most of the places I see it growing in Texas, it's going to be about a 12 foot plant uh, if given plenty of sunlight and some water to grow. It can get larger than that further south where it doesn't freeze back. Uh, it's not completely hardy in terms of the above ground parts, but if you mulch the base even further north, it should do okay. Uh, with a good thick mulch over the base and then just cutting the plant back to come back out again. It's not going to go too far north, but, but it should cover a, a good part of the state that way. Flowering Senna is a beautiful plant also during the year. It forms a shrub uh, that has dark green leaves. Again, another one like um, the ones I mentioned before that have the dark green leaves through the course of the season and then in fall it just explodes with flowers. Uh, this plant, although it's a shrub, uh, can be trained into a miniature tree form. And I want to say miniature because it's not going to get big enough to sit in the shade really, but you, you, can, uh, you can trim it up to more, we'll call it a standard form with a single trunk, but uh, it's not that cold hardy. I would take it up through 8B, eight, eight zone 8B eight probably, but one thing to know about cold hardiness is it depends on the weather preceding the freeze. Uh, if it's 80 degrees going up to 25 degrees, uh, you're going to get a lot of cold damage to a lot of plants that otherwise wouldn't have had it. Uh, 
but if it cools, up, uh, cools off slowly and, and kind of moves down more gradually, it's going to be, like many plants, a little more cold hardy. Uh, I would take it again up to about 8B. Uh, but the thing I, I just am amazed about uh, this particular plant is look at, the, look at the clusters of blooms. And you can see all the buds that haven't opened yet. Uh, just beautiful bright yellow. The sulfur butterfly likes this plant as well. Uh, and uh, just another reason to plant flowering senna. Chrysanthemums. It wouldn't be fall without chrysanthemums. Uh, but most of the florist chrysanthemums just don't do well in most of Texas in the gardens. Perhaps some in East Texas better than as you go West. And that is even true of Country Girl. Country Girl, though, is one that I think does really well. But this is another one uh, that should have been named Flopsy also. It wants to flop over everything in the garden, as you can see in this picture. And it's very hard to keep it compact with pinching, like some of the florist mums would stay compact with some pinching. But you can do some training through the year. Just stop all that by the time you, definitely by the time you get into midsummer, uh, if not a little before, to, to allow it time to set the buds for bloom. Uh, the bloom buds uh, form these little three inch uh, lavender pink flowers that are really beautiful do do uh i mean can you imagine something that would be a better cut flower uh, than country girl uh, chrysanthemum so pretty sweet autumn clematis uh, clematis turnifolia billows of fragrant white blooms in late summer to fall uh, and then uh, you you have to keep one thing in mind though about sweet autumn clematis the plant is an exuberant grower we could call it an aggressive grower. If you have a little trellis for it, it's just going to mound over the whole trellis and make it look like a bump in the landscape. Uh, it, you do need to do some shearing on it. Again, like our other fall bloomers, stop before too long in, in the summer on the shearing. But you, you want to contain it a little bit if you hope to have any particular shape or direction to where you want the plant. Because it, it is, it is a, a vigorous grower and it can do some reseeding also. So that's, I just throw that in as a little bit of a warning uh, that, that it can be a problem uh, if, if you have an area where you don't want it to re grow and recede, you may be doing a little uh, seeding as a result. But after the blooms come these spidery looking little seeds with the long strands attached, uh, which are I think also kind of attractive uh, as well. Coral vines. Speaking of enthusiastic growers, uh, here's one on a chain link fence. The best thing that could ever happen to a chain link fence is a coral vine. You can see it coming out of the ground in the, the lower uh, right side of the screen over here. Underground, there is sweet potato-like storage structures that uh, help this plant come back stronger and stronger year after year. Now, the common form is pink. There is also a white form that is also pretty, not as common to find. It, it's uh, a little harder to find in the, in the trade, but uh, it's worth looking for if you're looking for that. One of the things I really like about this plant is the fact that pollinators really like it. I've been under uh, trellises or arbors rather of, of coral vine when it's blooming and the place is just buzzing with bees. Now, if you're afraid of bees, I understand that concern, but uh, it, they're, they're not gonna bother you if you don't bother them. And so uh, just, just enjoy that. But think about the concern now over pollinators and all of our native bee species. Uh, and what a better thing than to give them something to feed on as they prepare to go into the winter season. Coral vine is also caused, called Rosa Montana. Montana, it's a native of, of Mexico. And uh, you do want to plant it though where it cannot get away. Uh, here's one that was put on an iron fence and uh, planted over by that building. And I think I measured one time, it went out about 80 feet from that fence. And you can see down at the end there, it's also now gonna take over the building. Uh, it's crawling up on anything. Uh, those power line drops coming in is just an opportunity for it to head out and conquer the telephone pole nearby. And if you think I'm exaggerating, here's my uh, one picture that tells it all. That is a full-sized windmill and coral vine is absolutely taken over the place. Uh, now, it doesn't have to be that way. You can shear it off and stop it. Uh, I don't want to discourage people from ever planting it, but just, I like to warn you, uh, so you don't come back later and say, hey man, you didn't tell me that thing was gonna take over the property and we're gonna have to move. 
uh, just just give it give it some time this plant runs like a kindergartner on the first day of school and so it'll anything it can grab onto uh, it'll do in fact I think we might ought to rename it coral kudzu here's one you may not be familiar with desert trumpet vine also called pink trumpet vine uh, I generally go by the name desert trumpet vine when you say pink trumpet vine uh, and desert trumpet vine uh, you are, you think about the true trumpet vines uh, Padrania ricosiliana is not the same uh, genus and certainly species as our true trumpet vines that you're probably familiar with uh, although the name desert is in the name sometimes it, it, it does best with dependable soil moisture but it's related to several of our common plants that you see in Texas landscapes look at those flowers up close and think about what does that remind you of Catalpa, maybe, uh, trumpet vine, or how about Esperanza or yellow bells? Can you see the resemblance in the blooms? It's, it's related to those plants. Uh, one thing about desert trumpet vine, it doesn't know if it wants to be a vine or a shrub. And so you get these long, gangly, uh, somewhat stiff vines going out that uh, you, you can do it either way, really. Uh, this particular person decided they were going to go shrub root and so they tipped the vines as they grew and kind of maintained a large mounding shrub in the landscape. That's something that you can you can certainly do as well. Uh, this plant is not completely hardy. Uh, if you get up in oh about the mid part of Texas, let's call it zone 8B, but I'd say somewhere around Austin, uh, north of College Station, across the state through there, uh, you're going to, or around College Station, you're going to find that this vine can freeze to the ground uh, any further north than that or even in a cold winter in those areas and so you would want to mulch the base well to protect that base so it can come back out again. Remember that some plants that bloom in the spring they're blooming on last year's growth that set buds in late summer and fall so if you prune them like cut them to the ground in the winter you have no blooms you get new growth but you have no blooms but these late summer and early fall bloomers are blooming on new growth so you could mow them to the ground every year and they would come back and still bloom like crazy for you uh, later in the season. Something to think about. One note about fall bloomers. Uh, we, we sometimes refer to plants as short day plants. Uh, poinsettias, for example, are referred to as short day plants or holiday cactus like Christmas cactus, Thanksgiving cactus, things that bloom at that time of the year. Most of the plants I've been talking about, with the exception of the bulbs, are what we would sometimes call short day plants. I think it's better to call them long night plants. And the reason is that they need a long dark period to bloom. Now you would think short days and long nights go together. As the day length changes through the year, the days get shorter and the nights longer, or the nights get shorter and the days longer. But while that's true about our diurnal patterns out in nature, it, it is not necessarily true about our plants in the landscape. And the reason is that the interruption of that nighttime period with light means that there wasn't one long night because they're long night plants, but there were two short nights. So even though the days are getting shorter, if you've got a security light that comes on, that security light in the middle of the night is gonna make the plant get light if it's close enough to the light and it's going to fool the plant into thinking that fall has not arrived yet because the plant is looking at how long is my nighttime. And over here by this door, there was a security light that shone on this plant. And look at what you see on the plant. The blooms that are appearing are all around the backside of the shrub. This is uh, Salvia regla, by the way. Uh, backside of the shrub where it was shaded from the security light and it was experiencing long, longer nights. And this tree trunk cast a shadow and we get some blooms in the shadow even of that tree trunk coming up into the plant. Uh, and I learned a lot when we had that plant at, at the Extension Office over in Travis County. And uh, that, that kind of reminded me that I, I quit calling things short day plants and I started calling them long night plants as a result. Now let's look at a few fall planted spring flowers. There are some things that we best plant in the fall so that they can really put on their bloom show in the spring. And poppies are the first one I want to talk about. I love poppies. So many good kinds of poppy. Uh, the red ones here in the picture are corn poppies, also called Flanders poppies as 
uh, in the old poem from the early 1900s, World War I, uh, in Flanders Field. Uh, the uh, the uh, um, poppy itself is a symbol uh, of, of uh, you see the little poppy pins that are given out to remember uh, our World War I, and, and, and sometimes it's used for other, other veterans as well. Uh, but Papava Roas is a beautiful little flower. Uh, poppies don't last a long time, but boy, if you have a cottage garden, you have to have them. And I think they belong in any garden. Uh, they're just so beautiful, but they plant it in the fall, grow through the winter like uh, a, a small little rosette of plants, not very big. And then in the spring, they pop up and bloom, like all those weeds in your yard that come up, carpet weed and chickweed and henbed and clover. Those sprout in the fall and go through winter and come out in the spring, blue bonnets, same kind of cycle. And so uh, you wanna plant these things in the fall. The next one, the, the beautiful golden yellow here in the bottom is California poppies. And this particular one has that beautiful butter yellow to golden color. There are yellow forms of it, not so golden, and are, are almost not so orangey. Uh, there's also uh, some white forms of this. And I like the foliage. Look at that finely cut fern-like foliage that it produces. Uh, the next poppy that I want to mention is Iceland, Papaver nudicale. Uh, Iceland poppy is worth including because it brings in a lot of colors that some of these other poppies don't offer. Uh, and Iceland, in fact, there, this um, corn poppy up here, I didn't mention it, but that, that is some, there's also a Shirley poppy that is a group of that Papaver roas uh, genus and species that uh, does have some other colors in it, somewhat like the Iceland poppy look down here, uh, but they're, they're really beautiful. The thing that's cool about poppy seeds in general, uh, they, they come up, or poppy blooms, they come up and the heads are bent over like they're nodding, nodding their head down. And before they bloom, they straighten up and pop open the blooms. Uh, I think it's kind of a cool uh, movement kind of adds a little grace to the picture. Now poppies do reseed and they'll you're gonna have to deal with with poppies if you leave them to spread their seeds in the garden. If not you want to clip a lot of those heads so they don't just go where they want to go but they go where you want to go. Uh, and here's a good example why. I think that uh, Johnny Appleseed has a cousin called Johnny Poppy Seed and that's probably how this ended up here, but it's at the base of a stop sign. So if the stop sign were gone, the poppy blooms on corn poppy would say uh, stop uh, for this car coming up to the up to the stop sign. Uh, that might be a good way of guerrilla gardening. You know, in fall, take you some poppy seeds and drop them in sidewalk cracks here and there and uh, just, just kind of scatter them about. Kind of adds a little beauty. Uh, some people might not find that beautiful, but I, I certainly would. The poppy that you're probably more familiar with is bread poppies. Bread poppy is also known as opium poppy because it's the same poppy that they get the white milky uh, sap from that opiates uh, are made out of. And the uh, opium poppy is illegal to grow in the United States, but you see them everywhere. Uh, I've never seen a granny uh, cuffed and shoved into a police car before for having some opium poppies out front. I prefer to call them bread poppies because they are also the poppy seeds that you would use in cooking or baking. Uh, and so you can grow those. Uh, the opium poppy is like up here at the top right. That single poppy is, is a very common form of it. And then there are a number of varieties in the lower left. This one, uh, notice there's a bee in almost every poppy photo. Uh, they love these things. Um, the, the one in the lower left is called Lauren's Grape. Lauren, like the girl's name, grape. Uh, and it just shows that there are some other varieties that you can plant out there. Uh, the uh, one in the top center is, uh, it, it goes by different names. It can be Papaver somniferum variety paeoniflorum, or it can just be sometimes Papaver paeoniflorum. Uh, paeoniflorum is a peony-like flower. That's what that means. And if you've ever been in a place that grows peonies or peonies, however you want to say it, uh, you can see some resemblance there. And then these uh, double is, is an understatement, multi-double uh, blooms that it produces. Uh, but the plant also produces these seed heads that I think are pretty cool. As they get ripe, they pull back. See how this lip is pulled back and opened up the chambers at the top? And this young lady's turning them upside down and just dumping all the poppy seeds in her hand. 
time to go in and bake bake some muffins or something. Um, that if you don't want these things everywhere, harvest them, keeping them upright, and take them inside, save your seeds, and then plant them where you want them. But again, I just want to remind you this is this is a plant that officially on the books is is an illegal plant to grow, uh, and uh, for it's because of its connection to opioids. And uh, if you want to read a really interesting story, Michael Pollan, some of you have read some of his books, Omnivore's Dilemma and other things. Uh, he's a good writer. He wrote a story or a, an article about uh, growing op opium poppies and finding out they were illegal. And then that sent him on this long search to look into it. It's a very enjoyable article, very fun to read. You might want to do that. And by the way, uh, breeders in some places are working on developing the Papaver somniferum opium poppies that have none of the opiates in them. Uh, I believe in India there's a variety called su Sujata that produces none of that latex at all. Uh, and so uh, that may just be something in the future that we have some. If somebody would want to go ahead and, um, you know, change the laws to allow for certain ones, I have a feeling that that probably isn't going to happen. Another fall planted flower is larkspur. Now some of these things like, like larkspur, you'll see people plant them in the spring, and you can do that but they're best planted in the fall. Consolida ambigua uh, comes in all kinds of colors of purple, blue, even a light sky blue and uh, pink and white. Uh, you'll find the blue forms to be dominant. And so if you let this patch you see in the picture go year after year reseeding, it will get bluer and bluer as time goes on. Uh, there's double flowered forms and a lot of these in the picture are double flowered. There's also uh, very common is the single flowered form. And the thing I like about the single flowered is if you look in the center of the flower, you see this little bunny rabbit. You can point that out to kids, grandkids or your kids, uh, that little bunny rabbit in the center of the flower, another good cut flower from our fall flower plants, fall flowering plants. Or excuse me, this is a fall planted spring flowering plant. Uh, but larkspur is a good, a good um, choice for your cut flower gardens. Uh, it, you know, you need to get kids involved in gardening and, and showing them little things like this, I think is cool. Showing them squeezing the cheeks of a, of a snapdragon and showing them how they open up uh, is, is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, they'll, they'll find that uh, kind of a cool thing as well. Sweet peas, another plant sometimes planted in spring, does best if planted in the fall. Latherus odorata, odorata, the fragrance of sweet peas is heavenly but a lot of the new varieties have been bred for particular flower colors or, or plant growth forms that uh, have left the fragrance behind. Not all, but some. And But you can still go back and from some seed companies order the fragrant old types. Those tendrils tell you that it wants to grab onto anything to grow and that's the best thing to do. I love cutting some of these and bringing them in as an arrangement indoors because they bring that fragrance with them indoors. And finally, Texas wildflowers. So many great Texas wildflowers. Seed companies offer blends for your area of the state. Uh, you can plant them by broadcasting. Uh, if you've got a little pasture or a little kind of a wild area that you want to mow down real close and broadcast the seed and then kind of kind of scratch it in a little bit to the soil, uh, they're going to sprout in the fall, a lot of them, and uh, then come up and sit there over, over the winter. Uh, just, just so many. I don't even... You know, we could spend a whole nother talk on wildflowers, but going across the top from left to right, we got wine cups and then we got mint. Uh, one of the Monardas, this uh, uh, horse mint, makes a great honey if you've got, if you're a beekeeper. Um, then there's a Gallardia or Indian blanket, a basket flower. Uh, in Texas, I grew up calling these buttercups, but they're really an evening primrose kind of flower. Uh, different kinds of tick seed or Coreopsis, uh, drum and flocks along the roadways. And uh, then standing cypress. You don't see this all over the state, but in central Texas, you'll see some of that. And my favorite, believe it or not, is the Mexican hat. So many beautiful uh, forms of that. And you talk about a plant you can ignore. In fact, it would prefer you to ignore it. Mexican hat is that. So if you're interested in more information on blue bonnets, Dr. Larry Stein will be giving a presentation on blue bonnets for our next Aggie Hort Facebook Live next Friday. At tw uh, that's September 25th at 1 p.m. So you definitely want to tune back in. You're going to learn more about blue bonnets than you can imagine. It, uh, they are our state flower, a wonderful flower to have. And uh, if you want to have a blue bonnet show next spring, uh, don't miss next Friday with Dr. Larry Stein. 
I and, and some others have been answering questions during this talk. I want to thank the folks from Aggie Horticulture, our specialists and county agents that help with that. Uh, and if you have a few more questions, we'll stick around for just a little bit uh, and answer those questions in the chat. And thanks for joining us today.